Hello everyone. Today, I want to introduce you to The Void. This is a game that I find really fascinating. I originally played it when the English version first came out in 2009. And strangely enough, I've never actually finished it, even to this day. But it's always stuck around with me. I've always just occasionally thought about it, and has really left an impression on me. And I finally decided that I really want to share it with other people. So, The Void is made by Icepick Lodge, which are well known for making very unique games. I'm familiar with two of their games other than The Void. Their first one, and probably their most well-known work, is Pathologic. That was an incredibly broken and fascinating game. And they also made Knock Knock, which came out quite recently, and I played it, and it was really, really good. And here is The Void, which came out sometime in between those two. So what is The Void actually about? What do you do in it? Well, here's a scene early in the game from the first person that you meet that kind of helps to explain that. This is a desert on the threshold of death. I think it's somewhere underground, but not deep. And around it, emptiness. You see how cold and still it is here, how desolate. But this is not yet your death. That awaits below, in the cold, when the last drop of color leaves your soul. We call it absolute death. Remember this always. Here in the void, nothing is more precious than color. Color is life. It is our food, our strength, our hope. It is the essence and meaning of our suffering. And now yours. You're a sort of wandering soul who's ended up in a kind of purgatory. Most souls just end up in absolute death, but somehow you've ended up here where you can possibly live. You can scrounge around and make yourself some sort of an existence. And your end goal is to, well, hopefully, ascend. Ascend to what? I'm not sure, but ascend to something. Something better than death. You're kind of half dead, I guess, in this purgatory. And in this world, color is everything. Color is food, color is life, color is what keeps you alive. If you don't have color in your hearts, you will simply perish. So let's take a look around at color and what it does and the kind of people and things and creatures that you meet in the void. So here we have Uta. She's one of the sisters. I believe there's nine or ten of them. I wonder what she's staring at. I love the environmental artwork. It is incredibly beautiful. Look at that. Look at her so serene. On this sort of... makeshift hammock thing. Over the water. Looking up at the moon. As the moon looks down at her. And color drips from the ceiling. It's an incredibly beautiful game, with some of the most gorgeous and unique environmental designs I've ever seen. It really is something to behold. So the way that you interact with anyone and anything in the void is through color. And there's many different types of color to use, and they all have different effects. So at the moment I only have a little bit of emerald and some of azure. And with these different colors you can paint glyphs. You can make shapes, which have different effects. And the way that you start a conversation with a sister is simply by touching them with a little bit of color. So let's do that with Uta, and let's hear what she has to say. Who 
Whose spirit are you? You must be lost. Death is below in the nightmare where you'll decompose atom by atom. Even eternal souls die if they have no color. At first they simply leave, then dissolve in the cold. You're on your way. Still, you're quite lucky your soul lingered here, and we are too, even though you're someone else's soul. But your luck won't last. There's only hunger, slumber, and waiting for the end to come. Our void lost its soul too. Now we call it the sleeper. A lost soul can only survive two months, 24 days and 24 hours before it dies forever. You can stay here, but what's the use? Color is gone. Still, I've heard the other sisters talking recently, but why am I telling you this? You're dead anyway, aren't you? Or can you give me a taste of the emerald or silver I love? Do you know how to do that? Everyone and everything lives on color. You and the sisters included. So if you hold down the control key here, you can see all the colors that I can paint with. And up in the top right are the colors that this sister likes. So she likes silver and she likes emerald. That's basically what will sustain her. I'm pretty sure if you give her colors that she doesn't like, I think it actually harms them, although I'm not quite sure. So I think I have a little bit... Yeah, I have three emerald, which is very, very little, but... She wanted a taste, so I'll give her a taste. So there's various glyphs that you can draw. This one listed at the bottom here is the donor glyph. And if I draw that correctly... Well, I will donate the emerald to her. So let's give her a little bit of the emerald. Let's hope I can draw this correctly. It's a little bit finicky. Oh, I ran out. Well, that's not gonna work. I gotta do it fast. Okay, that might work. So yeah, you draw the glyph that you want, and the longer that you hold it down, the more color will be put into it. So if you're using a donor glyph, then the more color you will donate, or if you're attacking an enemy, for example, which you can do with color, then the more color you put into it, the stronger the attack. So let's give her this. Okay, I didn't quite draw it correctly. Let's try that again. There we go. What are you looking at, spirit? Your master ceased to live, so you had to die. It was chance that you stumbled into the void, into the body of some other poor fool dying alive. Does the one who lost you want you back? What do you think? Do you wonder if he's trying to get his soul, you, back right now? Well, don't. He doesn't care about you. Nobody cares about anything anymore. And no one knows why nobody cares. It's a very existential game. And every time you give any sister color like that, they always seem to experience like... like bliss. Whenever you give them color. Which, I'm guessing is because they're basically starved. I mean, as she said, this place seems to be without color. It's kind of a wasteland. Color is hard to come by. So when you give them, you know, you're giving someone food after they've been starving for so long, so they just, they, they love it. Let's end the conversation. It's quite interesting, too, how the environment and the whole scene completely changes when you go to talk to them. Because when they're like this, you know, and you can't actually interact with them here. They're kind of, they're in, you know, they're in a place. Like, this is an actual place, but as soon as you go to talk to them, suddenly you're kind of like in a... It's almost like you're talking to their spirit. You're not really in a place. It's just kind of them, and they're surrounded by, like, mists. It's very strange. You know, in most games, you just converse with someone in the same location. You talk to them, and they turn to look at you, and... That's kind of how it would work. 
but the conversation takes place in an entirely different area. Alright, so that's one of the sisters. Now, there are more than just sisters. There are brothers. What are the brothers, you ask? Well, let me show you what the brothers are and what they look like. They're not as pleasant as the sisters. So we're about to switch to the overhead sort of uh, travel map. Let's go here. I'm going to slow the time down as much as possible. There's a lot to absorb here. Let me first just go to this. Okay, so what is this screen? Uh, this is you. And you have various hearts. Yes, you have multiple hearts. Uh, don't ask. Just because. <laughs> so at the moment, I have two hearts here. The hearts are basically the glyphs. So this one here is the first one that you get. And if you notice, the uh, symbol above it is the donor glyph. That's the one I just used to donate the emerald to Uta. And this heart over here has a different glyph. It's a circle. That's actually a type of shield. So if you draw a circle, you can make yourself a shield. So hearts are collected by getting them from sisters. So sisters themselves have hearts, basically, that you can unlock. So if you give them a certain amount of color, you'll unlock their heart, and they will give it to you. Which gives you a new glyph to use, and a new place to store color. So that's how that works. More hearts equals more places to put color, and more glyphs, and more glyphs equals more things to do. Oh, I'm sorry, I actually have a third heart. A third heart in my foot that I literally completely forgot about. Whoops. Well, let's not worry about that for now. So, there's color on the right and there's color on the left that you can see up here. So here's how this works. The color on the right is basically what you've collected and what you have in your sort of your... Think of it like your inventory of a sort. It's your uh, mass storage on the right. And this color here on the top right can't actually be used in any way in its current form. So the color up here is useless in its current form. What you can do is take color from your storage, like this, just hold it down, collect some of the color, and then I get to choose where I want to put it. So let's put it inside of this heart. There we go, so I just finished, I just filled that heart with that color. Now, as time passes, no time is passing right now, but as soon as I leave this screen, like when I go to, uh, when I go back to this screen, time will start passing. Um, as time passes, your hearts process the color. And after the color is processed, it goes over to the left here. And once it goes to the left here, you can now actually use it. So you have your storage tank on the right, and then you put it in your hearts, your hearts process it, and then it gets put in your kind of usable color storage. And from there, you can actually draw with it, so it needs to be in the pool on the left if you want to actually give the color to a sister, or attack with it, or shield yourself with it. So you have storage, and then you have processing, and then you have the finished product, so to speak. So if you look here, see I have 25 out of 25 of this color. So if I go to the overhead map, speed up the time a little bit, slow it down, let's go back. Now it's 19 out of 25, so now I've process processed some of it, and it should be... there it is, amber. Yep, 19 here, 7 here. So I processed it. And the thing is... The color that is currently in your hearts, that is in your body here in the center, is basically your health. If you get attacked by an enemy, they'll actually take color from your hearts. And if you get to the point where you have no color in any of your hearts, you die. So it doesn't matter if you have all the color in the world here processed, or all the color in the world here to be processed. If you don't have any in your hearts, if you don't have any color to pump through your veins, so to speak, you die. So there's a lot of ways to manage your color. And there's a lot of things that you can do with it. Alright, so now on this overhead map where time passes, let's show you the brothers. So I'm going to move down to this other chamber here. Um, let's see. There we go. Could move the camera for a second. So I am... Let's slow this down all the way. Okay, so I am right here. I'm at Uta's Grotto. Let's move down here to Sister's Greenhouse. So to do that, you just kind of draw a color in the direction that you want to go. Like this. I'm going to start moving. 
Speed up time so I go a little bit faster, and you're about to see the brothers. There's one of them. Not very pleasant looking, are they? We're almost depleted. And there's another one, and I believe there's a third one to be revealed. Start moving over here. Yes, to put it simply, wasting nerve from your hearts. To put it simply, they look like hideous monsters. They are absolutely terrifying. Also, I'm currently extremely close to death, so I've only got three color in my heart up here. I have a little bit more somewhere here. Where is it? I have three amber. So I need to go to this chamber. Let's let's go here before I die. Here we go. So time does not pass when you're inside of a chamber. So time only passes when you're on that overhead map. So I'm in, at no risk of dying here unless I get attacked by an enemy. And uh, that is not an enemy, by the way. That thing is a firefly, and it is adorable. So this is a garden, which is a key place to manage color. And in a garden, just like you'd probably expect, you can grow things, except you don't grow plants, you grow color. And yes, what you just heard there, by the way, was the color whispering to me. It's very creepy. The color actually whispers stuff to you. It tells you things like, I can protect you, or I can make you fast. Everybody seems greedy in this world, you know? The sisters want color. You want color to survive. Everybody wants something. This tree seems to be just bursting with color. Let's see how much is on it. Yeah, 36. 36 emeralds. Let's uh, take that. So you can actually plant color using the donor glyph, just like you use the donor glyph to give color to a sister, use the donor glyph to give color to a tree. And then when a certain... Those things are cute. Uh, when a certain amount of time passes, the trees will give color. Color instead of fruit. These only have a little bit for me to take. So this is one of the ways that you can manage color. Probably the most important from what I've seen. Like I said, I haven't finished the game, but... I've played through a decent amount of it, and I'm pretty sure gardens are really, really important. And these are little sort of growths, that uh, little sproutlings of color, that just kind of pop up around that you can also use to get some color. So there's many sources of color. There's trees, which are a sort of long-term asset, because in the short term they cost color, like, let's actually, uh, let's make a tree. So you can see this is my processed stuff. So I've taken the azure, I've put it into one of my hearts at some point. Let's put some more in here. Actually, let's take that out and fill it with something I have more of. You don't have enough color inside you. So let's fill up... You'll die as soon as you leave this chamber. There we go. No, no, I'm fine, sister. Don't need to whisper warnings to me. So I've just filled my heart with uh, 74 emeralds, so that means I'm going to be able to stay alive for a while. So at some point, I put azure into one of my hearts. And I processed it into this. So I've completely filled up my usable pool of azir. So let's use it to plant a tree. Or feed a tree, I guess. So you start by just clicking on it, just like you do with a sister. Just to kind of converse with it, start a conversation of sorts. And then you do the donor glyph. Which I'm probably totally... I probably totally messed it up, but let's fill it up and then boom. Yeah, the warning down below is telling me that I didn't draw it very well, so it wasted some of my color, but whatever. It's kind of, it's really annoyingly fickle with how it detects your donor glyph. But uh, yeah, there you go. So you decide how much color you want to put into it. You can put a little bit, in which case it won't give you much. Or you can put a lot, in which case it'll give you a lot. But it's a long-term gain, because in the short term, I've now lost that azir, so I can't do anything with it. I've used it up. And I can't actually get anything from it immediately. 
because I have to wait until a certain amount of time passes for the tree to give give you its its bounty. So in the short term, I'm worse off, and in the long term, I'm better off. Let's do another one here. Hopefully I can get the donor glyph correct. Now that's a good donor glyph, this better work. Okay, it did. No warning. So there you go. So if I go back out to this sort of outer map... Let's slow down time. So if you look up here, it says cycle 5, 11. So once, that, uh, once this gets to 0, it's going to go to cycle 6. And at the start of a new cycle, your trees will give you whatever you put into them. So let's go ahead, wait till the next cycle, here we go. Everything bursts with life for a second, and then let's go back to the garden and let's look at what we've got. Oh, and there's an enemy. Let me show you some combat, so it's gonna dive bomb me. So if I just draw a color on it, let's hit it with 15, there we go. Yeah, hit them with about 15, and they crumple to the ground. So predators do want your color. They will steal your color. Hey, little guy. Aww. You can actually catch those creatures, by the way, and collect their color if you put down some bait. If you just use the donor glyph on the ground, I believe. I messed it up. I messed it up again. And I keep messing it up. Well, it's too far to even get the bait anymore, but I do want to do it. There we go. Just to demonstrate what you can do. So you can put that down as bait, and if you get away from it, and one of those firefly things comes up to it, it'll actually start eating it. And at that point, you can sneak up on it and just collect it and get some color. So there's a lot of stuff you can do. You can... Oh, hi. You're gonna die. You're losing yourself. You're losing yourself? Is that one of the colors that just told me that? I don't know. So yeah, you can plant trees for color, you can collect it from those little creatures. I believe you can even sort of mine, I think. Although I haven't gotten to that part yet, but I'm pretty sure that was the thing. So there's lots of ways to conserve color and to farm color and to gather color. No one will protect you better than I. See, no one will protect you better than I, it says. The color whispers to you. It wants you to be its friend. You're one and only. It wants to be your favorite color. It's very cool. So a large part of the game is is this. I mean, hell, this is actually the main part of the game. It is, by and large, really about resource management. It's, I mean, it's a, it's basically a survival game. You know, it's a resource management sort of survival game, except instead of being the more, you know, real world kind of like you're hunting for food or something, as in many advent, uh, many survival games, instead you're hunting for color. Instead of planting plants, you're feeding trees. But it really is a survival game. I mean, as beautiful as these places can be, it is a wasteland. I mean, this place really is a wasteland. I am the color of your power and fame. And just surviving is very difficult. And that's what a large part of the game is. So let's go to a new environment to show you some of the, well, new stuff. I'll be your guiding light. Let's take this color with me. I don't need all of this color. Okay, that's creepy. I think that's the brothers warning me. The brothers don't like the fact that I'm conversing with the sisters and giving them color. So the brothers are rather jealous. They're kind of uh, linked or assigned to certain sisters. They're kind of they're like the guardians of a certain sister, and they're very protective of their sisters. So where shall we go? Let's go... Let's go to the mines. Oh, what is this? I don't know what that means. Is it coming... Are, are they coming to talk to me? Oh god, I think they're coming to talk to me. Ah, <gasps> uh, that's not good. I think we're about to have a conversation with a brother. Hi. I speak for all brothers, young one. 
Listen carefully and heed our words. We are happy that you have appeared, very happy. You do not have the right to be called Keeper yet, but we already think of you as our little brother. We are proud of you and glad that you ascended. But until you have learned and followed the commandments and seen the revelation, you are an enemy. One mistake and you could ruin everything. And if you act, we will execute you. For now you must wait. Study diligently and follow the commandments and your apprenticeship will be a blink in time. We will accept you into the Brotherhood of the Righteous and hold a feast in your honor. Rejoice, for soon your first mentor will greet you. I don't feel like I'm in a rejoicing mood right now. So yes, the brothers don't necessarily want to beat me over the head instantly. They're not just monsters. They have their own way of life. They have their own commandments, as you can see. But they're not exactly my friends. They think I'm one of them, but I'm not. I'm not a brother. They think I am because they're blind and they can't see who I actually am. Let's see what this says. I actually haven't read this. Through their righteousness, the brothers proved that they were worthy of a place in the void. The brothers climbed up from the depths, from a realm where color is unheard of, where the mind itself denies color's existence. Their act of faith was great, and it earned them their paradise, and here they saw Lympha of color, their image of a powerful god. There is no greater reward for a true believer than to become the keeper of heaven. The brothers have surely earned the reward, and the power of their law is now nearly infinite. Let's continue on to the mines. So, yeah, who do you trust? I mean, the brothers want you to keep your head down and not really do much. The sisters want color. But the sisters themselves are kind of jealous or protective. They don't want you to give color to certain sisters. So everybody is kind of looking out for themselves. The brothers are looking out for themselves. The sisters are looking out for, for themselves. You're looking out for yourself. You just want to survive. So who do you help? You know, whose side are you on? Do you even want to take anyone's side? Because you kind of have to. So there's this whole system of, like, alliances and... I guess you could even say politics to navigate. It's quite complex. And really hard to tell, like, what you should actually do. There's, there's no clear right or wrong answer from what I've seen. So yeah, this shows some of the, some more of the environment design. Look at this. These mines. Look at this weird towering spire thing with rings around it. And this creature is going to kill me if I don't kill it. About 15 should do. Some of the color is whispering warnings to me. And the further you go on, the more color you collect, the more enemies will appear. The land gets sicker and sicker and more... more covered in creatures that want to steal from you. Because they can sense it. They can sense the color, the life coming back here. And they're greedy and they want it. Just like everyone else wants it. I believe that glowing color up here is something that you could mine. Although I don't know how to mine it. But there is mining. Even the movement itself in this game is surreal. It's The entire game feels dreamlike. Like, there's no fall damage. You jump... You, you know, you jump very high and very slowly. There's no fall damage. And the way you move is very slow. It's not the normal kind of head bob. It's like a, this gentle sway back and forth. The entire game is just dreamlike. It's really fascinating. By the way, fun fact, below me is an Easter egg. If you fall down here and go up here, 
there's an easter egg which I think... I'm not certain, but I think it's a reference to Pathologic. Which was Icepick Lodge's first game. It's a fun little thing, so if you go up here... Should take me to it in a second. Here we go. So yeah, I think this is a reference to Pathologic, although I'm not entirely certain because I'm not too familiar with that game. I did play it, but it was a long time ago. Just a fun little fact. Let's go ahead and leave. So let's go somewhere new. Let's go to a new chamber really quick. And that will be the end of it. Oh god, I'm not gonna have to talk with him, am I? No, I don't want to talk with him. Whoever you are, you acted recklessly and vainly. You wasted precious color. You ruined the nameless sister's chambers. But worst of all, you almost woke the murderer that lives inside her. You must fix this criminal mistake. Rip her heart out and make her as she was before. You have one cycle to do this. Just one, do you hear? Then lie still in the void and humbly wait for us to decide your fate. Because right now, we don't like you one bit. They are freaking terrifying. They're really terrifying. And you can see how how jealous and angry they get. See, the fact that I gave... the I think she's called the Nameless Sister here. Let's slow down time. The fact that I gave the Nameless Sister enough color to um, open her hearts, which allowed me to continue on to the other sisters. Because that's how, it's, how it works. If you open the first heart of a sister, she gives you one of her hearts as a glyph. If you open the second one, she gives you access to her chambers, and the uh, the places that connect to her place. So it allows you to continue on. So the more, the more you feed them and the more they open up, the more things are available to you. And I did that for the Nameless Sister here so that I could access these two other chambers. And you can see the brother, the brothers, or at least that one brother, is jealous or angry. Thinks that she's, she's dangerous. And, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's... It's easy to just look at the brothers and say they look hideous, and they're monsters, and to assume that they're, you know, the enemies, the bad guys, and that the, the beautiful sisters, looking so serene and innocent, could not possibly be dangerous, but I mean, I don't know. Are they? It's something you have to decide. I generally don't know, because again, I never finished the game. It's quite interesting, the things it makes you think. So let's go here and show you one more environment. This is another place that has ridiculously beautiful art. Look at this. Some sort of... I don't know what she is. She's got like the upper body of a woman, but the lower body of a cat, I think. Like, it's just ridiculously beautiful art. The environmental art is ridiculous. It's so just lush and surreal and just beautiful. This whole place looks a little bit Egyptian, sort of. Like, what is this? I don't even know what this is, but it's wonderful. It looks like some gnarled old tree. And the music itself is also just as bizarre and fascinating as the rest of the game. And here is... What is her name? Ava? I think it's Ava. But yeah, I mean, just look at everything. Everything about the game. The environmental design, even the dresses that the sisters wear are all just so exotic and strange and beautiful. It's such a... A wonderful game. The strange thing is, though, again, I never finished it. 
And that's something I've thought about. Why did I never finish it? How come I still don't want to finish it? Despite all of this, despite how unique it is and how fascinating it is, you know, why did I never finish it? And frankly, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's easy to see why this game wouldn't, like, become super popular, you know, because I don't think many people know about it. It doesn't seem to be very well known. And I could totally see why, because a lot of games are easy to get into, because you know what to expect, right? Because a lot of games are very similar, they're very iterative. Uh, you know, with a first-person shooter, you pretty much know what to expect if you've played other first-person shooters. And so on. But with, I with Ice Pick Lodge's games, you really don't. Like, your previous knowledge in games is almost irrelevant for Ice Pick Lodge games. It's not like you're playing something that's really iterative. It's like every game they make is a self-contained universe with its own rules. And you can't really bring that much from other games to it, to kind of understand how to play it. So they're not very approachable, you know? They're kind of hard to get into. And if you look at them, and if you just like watch a one minute trailer or look at some screenshots, it can be really hard to tell what's going on. You look at it and you think, like, what is this? What do you do? You know, it's hard. It's hard to want to get into it. But I'm past that point, you know? I know what you do. I've played it for quite a bit in the past and a bit here. And yet I still don't want to finish it. Why? Let's jump on this weird little thing. I don't really know, honestly. There's quite a few games that I've encountered that are really fascinating and are enjoyable for me to think about and talk about. And they're the kind of games like this one uh, and I just, I'm glad that they exist because they're unique and it's really, uh, you know, in a world that is inundated with games that are so similar to other games. You know, it's, it's really easy to get sick of, of games, you know, yet, yet another zombie game, you know, yet another survival game, that sort of a thing. I think everybody's sick of one genre or another of game. And so it's wonderful to see games that just don't fit into any particular genre and are just so unique that they're hard to even describe. It's wonderful. But at the same time, it's a game that I just don't find engaging enough to make me want to keep playing, and I don't really know why. I don't really know why. It's very strange. It's... F I, I love it. I love this game, but I don't really want to play it. I mean, what is that about? It's something I've heard about Pathologic as well. Their first game. You know, anytime I hear a discussion about Pathologic, which has recently come into the news again because Ice Pick Lodge is going to be doing a Kickstarter to do a remake of it. And every time I see a discussion thread about Pathologic, there's always a bunch of people saying how, how incredible it is, and how amazing, and how there's nothing else like it. And there's also always people saying that they never could really get into it. And it's totally understandable. Because it's a sort of game that doesn't really... It's not really made to be fun. At least it doesn't seem like it. You know, it's meant to make you feel a certain way, but maybe the way it makes you feel isn't a way that makes you want to keep playing. Like, Pathologic was miserable. It was supposed to be, because it was a miserable game. It's a game about starving and death and disease and just a land gone completely sick. And the game itself was also... had that same feeling. You know, they didn't try to spruce it up with making it fun. They didn't try to make death and disease fun. They just made it miserable. Which makes it kind of hard to want to keep playing because it's just kind of a miserable experience. No, it's not the same for The Void. I don't think The Void is miserable to play at all. But I think it might be a similar thing. I don't think they make games to be fun or necessarily to be engaging, but rather just to accomplish whatever goals they set out to do to tell to tell a certain story, or to have a certain mood. And although this game certainly doesn't accomplish being engaging enough to make me want to continue playing it, or finish it, it definitely accomplishes the mood and the atmosphere very, very well. Incredible environmental designs, this wonderful, surreal, dreamlike feeling, strange music, such a strange environment to move around in, and a strange way of interacting with things by drawing glyphs and drawing color. 
It's a damn unique game. And I really love it. So, that has been The Void. It is available on Steam and possibly other places as well. I'll have links to all of that in the description. Thank you for watching.